Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's 2 o'clock, so we probably should get started since they've got us all fairly tightly scheduled here. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Stephanie Beveridge. I'm the Director of Library Services for the City of Huntington Beach. Um, thank you again for coming to this afternoon. We've pulled together, I think, a, an amazing panel to talk about what I find to be a very interesting and exciting subject that we were never really introduced to um, in library school. And, um, yeah, and it's one of those things that you kind of take for granted. Um, so as you know, the title of our program is Lost in the Library. Originally, we wanted it to be um, not all who wander are lost. Um, yeah, <laughs> but um, so we're going to be talking about how um, effective wayfinding design can break down barriers and improve access to services in our libraries. Um, so our panel today is me, and then I have Wendy Wilshire, um, owner of Wendy Wilshire Typographic Communications, um, who works on all kinds of wayfinding projects for organizations of all kinds. Um, Carrie Lixie, the library director from the Yorba Linda Public Library, and then Chris Knoll, principal li uh, from the Knoll and Tam Architects uh, firm. Many of you probably are familiar with their libraries and the work that they do with libraries. So, so I'm going to kind of give you an introduction from Huntington Beach's perspective. Um, we, uh, it's how to navigate your way through a wayfinding project in your library. Okay, um, the Huntington Beach Public Library uh, is um, a, a five library system, but we have this large central library. It's 115,000 square feet. It's a really interesting building. It's architecturally significant because in 1975, um, when uh, the first half of the building was built, um, it was uh, the last project that Richard Neutra was involved with, and his son Dion completed the project. Um, in 1994, that original Neutra building was expanded, um, and we essentially doubled in size. Um, it's 115,000 square feet, as I indicated, um, so it is kind of a rangy building, and um, it is complicated. I think that's kind of a nice way of putting it. Um, yeah, there are multiple levels, um, multiple staircases, um, and we have glass, and we have condensed stacks. Now, here are a couple of iconic images of the exterior of the Neutra side of my building. As you can see, it's very modern, lots of glass. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful place. People come in to the front door, and they look around, and you can see them kind of do the, wow, look at this. But then they kind of do the deer in the headlights thing because they don't know what to do. And here's, here you can see our condensed, our condensed stacks um, and some of my staircases. I like to say we're kind of like a modern Hogwarts. <laughs> Everything, yeah, you know, <laughs> there are times I'm convinced that these start, these start moving around. Um, there are lots of curves. Um, it's challenging to find your way. Um, the, the original wayfinding from 1975 um, is essentially non, non-existent now. Um, when they expanded in 1994, they ran out of money, so there's not much left. Um, for, uh, and there wasn't much that they invested in signage. Um, people ask direction, directional questions all the time. We average 184 purely directional questions a day. And um, so we knew we had a problem. Um, yeah, it was, here's some images to show the problem. There is incredible amount of visual clutter. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the, I love the stairs, watch your kids. Um, that, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and, um, yeah, and I inherited most of this signage. I, I started in Huntington Beach in 2009, and um, we worked on trying to modernize and, um, and make our services more effective and more efficient. And as we were working through that process, it became clearer and clearer that this was an element that also had to be addressed for the safety, security, and the service that we were providing to our community. So um, that kind of gives you an overview of where we were. And I also knew that I did not know enough to be able to do a comprehensive plan for this large structure. Um, I, I, I have staff who all, even now, I was like, well, we could just put up a sign. Yeah, as you saw, that doesn't really work. So um, yeah, we were we were very lucky to work with Lori Ayers 
um, on our automated materials handling process, and she gave us a reference to our next panelist, who I'm going to introduce now, Wendy Wilshire, um, uh, a, who came in and was our consultant and worked with us on a plan for our building. So I'm now going to turn it over to Wendy. So I'm going to um, talk today about effective wayfinding. So this isn't just a case of putting up some signs and um, thinking you know where people need to find things, but it's how to be really effective, how to make really good decisions when you're putting a scheme together. So um, effective wayfinding can help with so many things. Um, if you build a team together and you involve so many people, you can figure out what your wayfinding needs to do. So I put this list together. And it defines a space. It makes that space more appealing and coherent. Helps obviously helps people find their services. Um, it reduces the stress and anxiety. I mean, hands up this weekend, how many people have had any issues at all finding a meeting room? <laughs> um, it creates ease and confidence and security, which is a big thing that Stephanie was talking about. You know, in a building of a significant size. Uh, you know, if you lose your kid or you just can't get out or there's some kind of emergency, you're round and round in circles, it's a really big deal. Um, the other good thing about wayfinding is it helps to communicate that you're, you are offering a professional service here, that you do care about your user. You know, it's great if you've got this collection of something somewhere, but if no one can find it, then really how good is it? Um, it allows customers to have an independent service experience, which is something I've talked about here before a couple of years ago. Um, you know, some people out there do want to be able to come into a library and find things by themselves. They don't want to have to ask for help. They want to be in and out. And there are other people who, who really do need the help. So, you know, by managing that, we can give everybody the experience that they desire. Um, so wayfinding is a key component of that. Um, so it gives you the assistance when you need it. Um, there's a hidden cost related to all this. You know, one of my projects, um, they, they pull together all the questions that get asked um, on a daily basis related to a particular area of their library. And they added up their staff time, and they came up with a dollar amount. Like, that's what it's costing us for having poor wayfinding just for one area of their building. So once you start to quantify it like that, it, it makes it easier to kind of get the funding on board. Um, and then the other thing that needs to be very effective is helping the libraries grow. So, you know, the services that a library is offering is changing so much and growing to fit the community needs. And the wayfinding needs to support that. You know, when I put a scheme in a building, I want it to last 20 years. You know, I want the client to get good value for money. Um, and, and I want it to stay accurate for those 20 years. So being able to update it in a cost-effective and easy manner, I think, is an important part of effective wayfinding. So, um, when starting a project, the biggest thing to me is to understand what we are trying to do. So before we do any design work, we'll come in and assess library needs, user needs, the services that are on offer, and what the goals of the library are. We'll talk about what are you hoping to achieve in the next few years, what services are you hoping to offer, um, how d what is an ideal day for a customer coming in this library, you know, picture it. And, and, and we'll come back to that. That kind of forms our first foundation block when we're putting together a, a project. The next thing I like to do is observe and gather evidence, especially on an existing library. You know, like one like Stephanie's that has lots of problems. I just camp out there for a few days, watch what happens, watch the customers coming in, watch how the staff interact um, with them. This slide, <laughs> the most uh, exciting slide, but this poor guy, he had no idea. He knew what he wanted to find. He went round and round in circles. He retraced routes. He went down different areas. And I feel awful. I'm, I'm following him, you know? <laughs> I can help. I can step in and help at any given moment. But I need to see what he's doing because I need this documented to help Stephanie get her funding to get this project through. So um, once I'd gathered my evidence, I stopped and, and had a chat with him, helped him find it. But you can see the environment he's in here now. I mean, he feels like he's in the wrong place. He's pretty sure this is not where he's supposed to be, but he's got, he's got nothing to go on at this point. So. so on that basis, it's always good to have statistics in your back pocket. 
So, you know, when I'm working on any design, you know, as I said before, I'll always look at the user needs, whoever that user is, the staff, the customers, visitors, whoever. If you can substantiate that with some statistics, that can really help when you're dealing with funding bodies. You know, when you can go to them and say, well, this is the situation we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, with Stephanie's situation, I spent a lot of time in the library putting together a case for her, essentially. And you look at different things like, you know, how are the staff interacting with customers and how does that compare to the service model that Stephanie wants her library to be? Um, we monitored all the questions that get asked at the service points. What directions are being asked? What areas are really hard for people to find? Um, which staff, which um, tasks are requiring the most staff assistance? That allowed the library to take a real good look at where their staff time was being spent. And you spot my number earlier because yeah. you said it, but yeah, um, yeah 1,100 questions in six days and all of those were directional. Where are the restrooms? Where do I check out? Where's this? None of those were reference research related questions. So that was a significant. So that's been a really key figure um, in getting the project funded. It really, those statistics show people there's a real problem. Um, and then once we've gathered everything together, it's time to write a brief. And I cannot stress the importance of a brief. So no matter how you're approaching a wayfinding project, whether you're working on a new build with architects, whether you're <coughs> working on a low budget, you've got an in-house designer and you're putting something together, um, get that brief together. And that is your biggest foundation. You can base so many decisions off that. It's not a case of, oh, you know, this, this blue will look really pretty in this library. Well, I don't think it will look really pretty in this library. You, know, you, you come back to your foundational blocks, what's going to work in this space. Um, so to hand over to Carrie now, she will talk about being on the client end of a new build. And I just want to add to Wendy's a little bit to just say that it's all about, you know, you can use all the statistics and tying it back to access and that this is really what's best for your patrons and how they're going to use the library that also maybe can be a catalyst with your city council if you need it to be. So uh, we, I'm Carrie Lixie. I'm the library director at Yorba Linda Public Library. We are a suburban library in Orange County. Uh, and so part of what you need to do when you start embarking upon a wayfinding project, especially with a new build, is think of the big picture. So thinking about the city and what it does, and then it's probably always good to just double check and see if your city has any standards in terms of signage. Uh, I actually live in the city of Long Beach, and they just put out a whole wayfinding package that, si that standardizes all the signage in the city. So if there's a way to tie into that, that's a good thing to check with. So here's the other part of the big picture is you have to look at the architecture. So you not only have to look at what's going on inside of your library, but you have to look at what's going on outside of your library. So we're currently working with group four architects. This is a beautiful rendering of our building. What we heard from the community is that it Want, they want it to be sophisticated and timeless. So in thinking of some of those themes is what uh, we end up going with as well. And the other part of it is, is you need to understand your whole entire brand. So your interior, your brands, everything that goes along with that. So we're actually partnered with the Cultural Arts Center. So we need to be thinking about how we can relate to that building as well. And not just, hey, we're the library. We've got to do all this. This is our side. And that's the cultural arts side. We really need to connect to these two buildings. And we also have, in our city, two different funds. So we're not part of our general fund. So a lot of this, there's a lot of back and forth with Parks and Rec. I don't know if you, any of you have ever experienced that but uh, we need to make sure that we're all one cohesive thing so again going back to the big picture and then wayfinding is beyond signage it's not just signs so we can all make signs we can make good signs we can make bad signs but it's beyond signage so what's really cool about it is you can use design elements to subtly enhance your wayfinding. So what you see here is this is our children's and tweens department. And you can see that we've painstakingly picked out some 
colors and carpet. And what what's really cool when you use your finishes is you can use those to bring people in and draw people into your library with the flow. So you can see here, this is the spine through the library. So it's a pathway down. The lobby is over here, bigger picture thinking. So this is the teen, tween area with the green and then children's has the blue and you can see the paint accents that we have for that. And then same on the second floor with the teen and the adults, they also have the spine. So we also are taking carpet and using these destination spaces in there. So they're almost like area rugs and the um, study rooms have their own carpet. So again, you're using some of these subtle ways with your finishes to really bring people into the library and to make it flow. So part of this also, because we're a new build, so I won't go into my library maybe is not as hard to find things in as Stephanie's, but we do refer to it as the Winchester House because it's like, where do people go? What's going on? At this point, we're not investing in any new signage, so let's just forget about the old library. But what's interesting is, is we have, um, we're gonna have, luckily, a couple new spaces in our library. So currently, well, we had our teen space kind of in a closet that was a storage closet that we made a teen space and then we sort of moved it out and now it's next to passports and it's all crazy and then everybody's probably experiences the same thing with tweens you have all these tweens now coming in and what do you call these spaces and how do you brand them and so for us you know tweens don't call themselves tweens so uh, we're naming the tween space, which is right here, the 678 lounge. And then you can see we have the teen loft. It's upstairs, so trying to make it cool and hip for those teens, so those are up there. But other things you need to think of is, are you gonna call it checkouts? Are you gonna call it accounts desk? Uh, are you, is it kids in your library? Is it children's? What are people already, how do they already identify with these spaces? And so when you're going in a new building, do you really want to change that? Everyone calls it children's in our library, so we're going to keep children's. But we do have the opportunity to brand some new spaces. So there, it is a roadmap. Branding can also be a part of a wayfinding and your roadmap. So this is what we're doing is when we think about branding our spaces. So we've got the uh, Boho Chic for our teens, right? Southern California is like the hub of all boho chic everywhere um, with LA right next to us. We've got children's as eclectic and cool. We've got the tweens as retro and chill. And then we've got the adult as modern and elegant. All of these have colors associated with them. So when we go to create signage or wayfinding or do any marketing, everything can come together as one. And so these overarching themes really help us to start thinking about how we're gonna create signage, how we're gonna have people flow through the library. And then one of the interesting things is uh, in the library is you, with the flow of the library, there's something called bump points. I call them bumper boats here, just to try to be clever. But uh, it's really kind of interesting. So bump points are, when you walk into a building or say you walk up from a subway or you walk in top of an escalator in the Santa Clara Conference Center and you're hoping, you're looking around and you're saying, where do I go? What do I do? So it's really important that you think about what is going to be in these bump points and where they are. So some libraries actually create some temporary, like semi-permanent signage. When they build a new facility, they don't even put in permanent signage. We've decided that we think we know the flow of the library pretty well and where these bump points are gonna be. So we are going to look at the flow of the library, look at the architecture, and utilize that to create places to naturally put signage and arrows and where people should go so they can find the Mendocino room at noon for their talk today. <laughs> so the other part of it is to keep it simple. 
So it's really easy to be drawn into trends, to be drawn into font trends, no more Comic Sans, but that was really popular back then, uh, and to understand that it needs to be readable and you need to see all those things, and to be drawn into themes and having lots of stuff going on in your wayfinding and signage, so whether it be a bunch of books or a jungle in the children's room, and then making all of the signs jungle themed, you just really want to keep it simple. People just really want to see where they're going. Think about when you're in the airport or you're in a, you're in a hospital. Just tell me where I need to go. I just want to be able to look and go. And so you don't want a bunch of clutter around that. So here's three different ways to keep it simple. And for me personally, when I see these three, I really can't read the one on the end. But the one in the middle, I really like. This font is everywhere now. It's at Paper Source. It's at all the places. And it's got this beautiful little branch underneath of it. I could totally love that, but it's not really that readable. So which one is readable is this one on the end here. And part of what you want to do to make these readable and not follow trends, you're really creating an equalizer so that people don't think, oh, this library is this or this library is that, because you are communicating through your signage. So it's really important to be equal, that everything looks equal, that everything is simple and keep it the same so people feel welcome, comfortable, they're not going to turn around. It's just like, um, you know, when you go to a place and, like, I won't go in if I have to find parking and drive around and stuff. I'm just like, I'm too old for that. So you just want to make sure that people are like, well, I don't want to, you don't want them to turn away from the library because they can't read your signage or they don't, um, they can't find their way around. And we all know everyone's already intimidated of the shushing libraries and so... Really, this ends up being about access. So what architects will do when you start working with architects, or probably Wendy or any designer that's going to do this stuff, is they're going to give you some images. So these are just a few of the images that we were given to choose from. We really were drawn to something like this image right here. I think it's really clear and easy to read. This one is as well. We kind of liked the stencil, so as much as I talked about not having ornate stuff, I did, I did like some of that. So what we're doing in our building then is starting to look at layers of negative and positive space. So things can be backlit, they can be lit in different ways if we need to. They're simple, they're clean, and they have contrast. So a couple of things is, so then we kind of, once you start talking with your architect and you like these images, you don't like those images, you're going around. So then you end up getting some, some sketches of, hey, what do you think of this? What do you like of that? So one of the things is clarity being very important. I really like this sign because of the clarity. You can see that it's white. You can see what it says. So I really like that. However, I'm not necessarily a fan of the horizontal. I don't think it's as easy to read. So we went and talked. And so then we also got this as something is, uh, is an option for us to put above our DIY studio. And what I like about this is that it's horizontal. It's pretty easy to read, but and I think it might just be this picture, but the contrast isn't quite where we want it. So, so we're talking, and we're going back and forth, and we're making these compromises, and we're saying, yes, we want white. We want it horizontal, and then going back and forth there. So these are really, I would say that these are all probably universal tips. So when you're talking to your designer, your architect, whoever that is, is the first thing you need to do is be confident. You all know your communities, and you know your libraries best. You get those gut feelings about what's going to work and what's not. So you need to be confident going into the project. You also need to be honest. If you don't like it, I mean, you don't have to be a jerk and say, I don't like that, that doesn't look good. But you can say, hey, you know, I'm not sure about that, or I don't love it. But you need to be honest. You need to have honest communication with your designer, because you're going to have to live with this for a while. Obviously, the public's going to have to live with it for a, a while. You're not going to be able to change this anytime soon. So you really just need to be honest about what you think is best for your library and your patrons, and then also always be honest about what the outcome is to be, which is to bring people in and have access. 
then you need to take the lead, which doesn't mean you're going to run the project, but what it does mean is that you're going to just be proactive. You're going to find examples and share photos, Pinterest. I love Pinterest, so does everybody else, I think, so show them that. And then you want to talk to your colleagues and share antidotes about what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, and really be able to tell your story to architects. And then last but not least, nothing is perfect, so don't expect it. It's the hardest thing I've had to learn in this project is that I'm hoping that everything from our our AMH to our spaces to everything else, guess what? It's going to be perfect and awesome, but you're going to have to compromise somewhere. So we all deal with our issues of perfection, and uh, I think that it's just don't expect that everything is going to be perfect, and you are going to have to compromise. And then especially with signage, there's people that are never going to read the signs anyways, so <laughs> what does that matter? So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Knoll. <laughs> And now we're going to talk about, you know, the architect's perspective. And, um, I, you know, we deal with the physical side of things. And we need to translate your vision, your goals, into something that is a physical form as best we can. And I think that wayfinding is a key element. It really goes to the core of what we're trying to do for you. You know, it goes to the vision. I'm going to sh I'll show you some case studies of how, we have, uh, how we've done that and translated that into um, in, in the physical form. But the design has to work. It has to make the user's experience really great. Uh, it has to make the staff's workflow really work well. And it's really not about doing a beautiful architectural design if it compromises either of those two things. So it's really important to come back. And I think keeping it simple uh, is one of the core things that we want to do. Um, so these are some of the things that, that we want to do in terms of our role. Uh, it's, uh, we like a linear process to follow. Um, that really helps. So the more that you can do uh, in terms of these things, uh, being clear about what you want to do ahead of time, setting your goals, you know, thinking about what your brand is, how you're trying to do this, um, and um, give that to us. It'll make our life a lot quicker and easier and work kind of expensive to work with sometimes. So it's good to you know, get as much as possible. But if you really need us to help you figure out the concept, that's part of the process too. Let's just make sure we set aside the time uh, to do that in any process. So I'm going to show you um, several cases of new construction uh, and then one of a uh, renovation because, you know, you've got all kinds of things. And i I got to say, uh, Carrie's library um, is the Winchester mystery house of, and it is the most, it's my, it's my poster child for how bad wayfinding can be uh, anywhere in California, I think. And <laughs> so you're really lucky to have a new one. I think tearing it down and starting over was the right move. Yeah. <laughs> But sometimes that's sometimes. really what you have to do. So um, our Hayward Library is almost done uh, with construction, but it started out with a diagram like this. We, uh, we fooled around with putting it back in the park where it was, but very quickly early on we decided it was much better to put it on an urban site uh, out of the park uh, for a variety of reasons. But it meant we had to have a three-story building. Now, a three-story building, then you need to sit, figure out where the functions are going to go on that because we want it to be something where people come in and really intuitively find their way around. So, we had this sort of philosophical division on the ground floor of kind of fundamentals. These are the, you know, the children's areas there, but the lobby, the cafe, the public stuff is there. Second floor is about technology, innovation, and the big public meeting spaces are there, and that's where the teens are as well, and then the computers are there. And then the third floor is more of a quiet, focused, reflective space uh, where most of the books are in the adult areas and the place you can go you know, to get away and also has the community learning center in it too. Um, the whole library is branded as a community learning center um, and we wanted people to really embrace it. Um, so this is a section through the building that kind of shows again how those things stack up with the children's on the first floor. So on the left hand side of the atrium are the library functions, on the right hand side are the public and community functions. Uh, and these things stack up really well with the atrium being the thing that ties it all together. Um, this is a plan diagram also showing. So again, going back to the real basis, the core basis of your design and trying to figure it out. So in this one, on the left are the library functions on all three floors. On the right are the community functions on all three floors and the staff and the support areas are at the back. Um, we pull those apart to create circulation paths to tie things together and play ways for light and views to come through. So you always have these long views through the library uh, and then you sort of connect across the, between, those, uh, between those areas. And that makes for something that at the, even before we really designed the library, we were able to kind of know that this is going to be an easy place for people to figure out where to go. Um, because um, if you can do that well, 
uh, then you've, you don't really need much signage. Um, the, the atrium was something that people you know, said, well, why do we need an atrium? It takes up space, it creates a big hole in the floor that we have to work around. Um, but we came up with a whole lot of really good reasons. And the first, you know, was the, it's the heart of the building, and then the library is the heart of Hayward, and Hayward is the heart of the bay. Um, it brings in daylight. It was a very energy efficient building. We needed to bring daylight into the middle. It provides ventilation. But the visual orientation was something that you always are able to see the atrium and orient yourself and you can find your way around that library just by knowing where you are in relationship to that space. Uh, here's some pictures. It's not quite done with construction, but this is standing at the entrance, the park side entrance, looking, at the, looking all the way through the building to the garage entrance. You can see all the way through. Having these clear sight lines was really important. On the right hand side or the ca is the cafe, the bookstore, the, the browsing area. On the left is the children's area on this floor. As you go up on the second floor, looking right through, again, you can, on the very right hand side, you can sort of see that axis that goes from edge to edge of the building with windows at either end. So when you get to that point, the staff area is to the right, and then the library function is to the left. Um, again, just having those long views and vistas really helps you figure out where you are. And you can see all the way through to the teen area, so that we're able to sort of basically staff this library, which is about four times the size of their current library with the same number of staff. Uh, and because of, again, because of the sight lines, there's lots of benefits for doing this. Um, but the, the atrium really is a kind of a wonderful place. It's gonna be used for many, many things, and it really, uh, really ties the building together. Um, this is our Los Gatos Library uh, in, in uh, Los Gatos, California. It is a, uh, it's, again, it started out with a diagram like this. The gray is the existing Civic Center, that the library was in the lower left uh, quadrant of that, and we wanted to have something that's uh, related to that from a planning point of view, but sort of turned it all inside out. So again, a very simple form of you enter in the center, and there are these cross axis. It's a simple rectangular building. The floor plans kind of follow that as well. Again, it has sort of a central atrium. Uh, but when you walk in the front door, you know, you can see everything there. You can, the doors on the left over there, the, the, the circ desk, browsing area, and a cafe on the left-hand side. You can see all the way up. The stairs lead you up. You know exactly where the children's are with a kind of a cute little sign. And all the other functions are upstairs. Uh, and you can see through the building. So if you stand at any point on the upstairs, you can pretty much see where everything is. And well, there are signs, but they're sort of fairly... Uh, they're sort of more graphic and in, 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 in interesting signs there. It also has a lot of transparency with all the glass walls. Again, this is in the far corner where the teen area is. You can see through several layers of glass all the way to the, where the one reference desk is on this upper floor. Um, our Valley High Library was designed sort of with a lot of energy in mind. So this was a library that, uh, you know, is made with, with, with a form that is designed to let in natural light. Again, very low, very energy efficient building, but you can see where the front doors are. That spine goes all the way down. This is the plan. You can see the entry is on the right-hand side, and there's a corridor, kind of there's a circulation path all the way down. Everything comes off of that path. So again, when you walk in and look down that way, you can see everything there is to see in the library at once. You don't really need to look around uh, and wander around corners and have hidden things. And again, it's a very easy library to, to supervise. And just completed our Half Moon Bay Library. It's about 22,000 square feet. Uh, again, the scale was broken down into several pieces uh, because we wanted the building not to feel too big for this, for this community. But again, a very simple and very clear organization. Uh, the lobby is transparent on both sides, so it feels very welcoming when you come in. But as soon as um, you enter into that lobby, um, again, you can see the children's areas just on the left, and that's the circ desk there. The stairs lead you up to the adult and teen functions on the upper floor. Um, once you're up there, you have really transparent views into all areas. And again, for us, this is like keep it simple, keep it transparent, and you won't really have to add a lot of signage. But the signage we do have is by Wendy, and it's really lovely, uh, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Actually, I could show you here that on the left-hand side, that green is patinaed copper with, you know, lovely lettering on it. There's some very nice signs on the outside that I glossed over there. But again, that idea of just have really clear glass and be able to see everything that you want to see. Uh, renovation is a lot harder because sometimes you're dealt, you know, a card like this one, which is the Sonoma State Library. Um, and it's a big library. It's about 200,000 square feet. But it was built um, by some architects that really didn't really think about the library very much. And it's, in, it's got two wings, a north wing and a south wing that are connected by a little sort of narrow node. It's on three floors. And 
you, you, wherever the entrances are, you can't see anything about what, where you're going to go, how you're going to go. Students are lost and wandering, and you know, it's really inefficient use of it, its building. So we started out, because um, it was a, it's a wayfinding and a reorganization project of overlaying some diagrammatic approaches here, which look at creating and opening up you know, vistas and things like that so that we have a better sense of organization. Now, what we're drawing is going over a lot of physical form. There's a lot of walls and rooms and things in there that are going to have to come out. We're not going to tear the building down, um, but we do have to do a bunch of interior work, and so we're in the process of working through that. But, you know, in addition to creating these zones of, you know, circulation and tying the entrances together, we're also looking at, you know, cutting a hole in the floor here um, to tie the areas together vertically, because right now you have to come out into a stairway, go up, and then come come back out on the upper floors, and it's, it's very disconcerting, because each time you come out, you have no idea where you're going. So um, along these axes also, we're looking at adding in elements of materials and colors and um, art and digital forms to kind of line these, these long vistas and these corridors with a lot of stuff happening in on them, but setting them up on each floor so that where the elevators are will be one element. So you'll be able to see that all the way, you know, from a couple hundred feet away, you'll be able to say, well, that's where the elevator is or the stair uh, or things like that. So we have these sort of nice diagrams that we're working through as to how we're actually going to bring those finishes uh, in to make this um, thing really work organizationally. Uh, and then this, these are sort of knocking that hole in the floor was, you know, something that they actually they adopted that right away because uh, um, there is no connection from the first floor up um, and you have to actually go out of the building. And so adding this sort of something in there like that with some stairs that lead you up, uh, it's a way for people to sort of hang out and look around. These are sort of very preliminary renderings just to give people a general idea of what it's like. <clears throat> but here's some renderings of another library where we did a similar thing at the University of Redlands. Um, again, knocking a hole in the center of an old building made all the difference. It brings in natural light, but it also helps people with a great way of sort of circulating through, and it becomes the place where people get together and meet and study and all that. So anyway, that's sort of how we do it as architects, you know, which is to, you know, have less signage and, and simpler forms. So I'm just going to quickly go through a series of case studies. Um, this first case study, you know, we talked at the beginning about how you have, you know, your brief and your goals as a foundation to any project, and there's multiple, there's multiple goals in any project. So each case study, I'm just going to focus on specific goals. So this first one was how do we break down information? Um, this one is a multi-level library. There's probably 10 different floors if you work it all out, but none of them equate to each other horizontally. Um, there's, n there's no order, there's no sense of flow. So, you know, we look at different strategies of, okay, well, we can't change the layout of this building. It is what it, it, is, what it is, it's not the budget for that. But how can we make it perceived by the users that it's a lot more organized than it, than it is? Uh, we look at the access points. We look at how floors relate to each other, either horizontally or vertically. We look at the flows between them. Um, we might create some names for geographic areas, and that way when we're directing, we don't have to direct to 10 different destinations. We can direct to a particular wing or a t particular area. Um, and then within that, you know, we were looking at having a color-coded system so we can start to pull apart some of those services. So when people are working their way through the library, they can latch on to whatever color it is that's related to the services they're looking for. So this is an example of how you know, one of the signs would come together, um, and that close-up shows that, okay, we've now got these wings, these areas that we're directing to. Um, within that, we've got a number of different destinations, and this color code follows throughout. Um, and these three sign visuals show, you know, the elevator one is, is the neutral. You know, it's, it's not related to a particular service or facility. It's a core of the building, much like a restroom would be. And we've got then the study rooms, which still pick up the same design, but we've got the featuring of the color code. And then onto the friends, which really um, strengthen that color code, and we've given them more of a visual brand. The whole thing comes together as this cohesion to get people through the building. Second case study is on the Half Moon Bay Library that I worked on with Chris. Um, the aesthetics and the, the, the 
blending in with the library to create a cohesiveness was, was very important in this one. We've got some beautiful finishes. The furnishings are all like really nice. Um, you know, the wayfinding needs to build on that. It needs to fit with the community and fit with the space. So we've got these really nice materials that we use throughout the library. Um, there's another example there. And the third case study focuses on versatility. And that, I mean, that is a common thread pretty much on any wayfinding project I work on, that things are changing. We, we're, we're putting a lot of money into this scheme. We need to be able to update it and keep it current. So um, this network of libraries have got all sorts of different pieces of information across their network. Um, this example of a sign, it can, it can come apart. Parts of it can change. They can move it between locations, and it's still relevant at that location. So they've invested in you know, a core of, of a sign, um, and they can take it with them. Um, this one you know, is a directory. We all know things change. Rooms change, purposes change. You know, the front lens can come off this sign. We can put a new lens on, and we're still making use of all that hardware. Um, and then we have signs where we need to be able to update them in an instant. So we have those as well. Um, the last case study is about brand integration, which you know is always a factor. Um, it's just how much of a factor it is. Um, this particular library network has got like 25 locations, and they range from a tiny little one-room library house through to you know a really enormous facility. Um, they've got a series of new builds. They've got a series of older buildings. So we worked with them to create this brand, um, and then we've rolled out that brand across their network. So you know, it's gone into the, the new builds um, right now. It's rolling into the existings to follow. And the, this example of a sign is a site identifier. And they said, you know, our brand is so strong, we need to unite these 25 locations. We need people to know they've come to one of our services. So the branding's really heavy on the site identification. And the branding is fairly heavy on some of those um, key facilities in the library. You know, these meeting rooms that they have are actually, they're more like the community spaces. They're big hubs. Um, people from outside come to use them. So we want to promote our brand on that. We want to tie that in with all our literature, all our promotion, all our marketing. But then when we come to our, our general services and facilities, we don't want that so heavily branded because, you know, the brand can change, the brand's going to evolve. You know, we don't want to be replacing all the signs in 15 years if we redo our brand. So we apply the, the logic of the brand, but on a pared down approach. And then here it gets taken, um, it's in construction right now, it's a more whimsical approach. So we've got the same brand, but we've tailored it to better fit the space and fit with the, um, the interior design and the furnishings that are going on. One thing that always comes up is how we measure success of a scheme. You know, you can get somebody to come in and put in some signs. You can put in some signs yourself. How much are they helping? Who knows, right? Uh, we talked before about, you know, you set the goals of a project. You look at the statistics. Well, so as you're designing, you know, we constantly go back and revisit all of those. Are the user needs the same? Have the services changed? Have the goals changed? We look at statistics, is anything changing? We go back to the brief, we make sure we're hitting everything. So we're feeling confident all the way through. And then once something gets installed, it doesn't stop there. You know, you're still assessing what's going on. How are people responding to this? Have we changed how we're offering our service model? You know, have we got different facilities on offer now? Um, have we got a different demographic? Is our neighborhood changing? Um, so by continuing to assess that, you can keep things up to date and make them current. Okay, so I, I get to wrap up. And um, so um, in Huntington Beach, we went through um, all of those steps that you just heard described. You know, we looked at um, our building, uh, the significance of that building, both to the community and to, um, you know, the powers that be. Uh, and um, and uh, we focused on our users and user design. How was the building, was it, you know, what was working, what wasn't working? Um, and, uh, you know, we, we also um, made the case multiple times through uh, way, initial wayfinding study and then presentations to various boards about the, the problem 
um, and the statistics that showed the impact and um, how big of a problem that we had. Um, and that generated enough support to get into, uh, a capital improvement project approved um, for us to proceed. We did the design work with that um, and had enough money to basically fund a portion of the um, fabrication and installation of the final design product. Uh, um, and then because we had done all of this really good data um, mining, you know, this good work evaluating and looking at how the building was and wasn't working and how people were using it, what the community needed and expected from us, um, we were able to get support from our friends of the library to help fill any gaps that we thought we might have in terms of fabrication um, and installation. And so right now we are um, waiting to get our council's approval on our final contract. We have a vendor lined up. We did go out to bid, got a, a good bid. It's, we have over 600 different sign types um, that are um, going to be made and installed in the Huntington Beach Public Library. Um, and uh, we've done um, tours and we have done scavengers, scavenger hunts. Um, for individuals that have had questions about the project and what we were doing and why this was important. Um, and we've uh, been able to gather a lot of community support with our friends, other members of other organizations in the community that use the library and that recognize that this kind of project is going to make a big difference and it really is going to improve the service that we offer, the services that we offer over time, you know, and keep us um, viable and sustainable in the long term. So um, there are lots of lessons to be learned in our process. Um, I won't go into detail right now because we're starting to run out of time. But if you want to hear about some of the roadblocks and some of the challenges that you might encounter. Um, but if you go through and you f follow the, um, the process and you trust the data and, you, and you, you're um, paying attention to what your community wants and needs and how your library is working, um, you can develop the uh, political case for this and get the necessary support to make it happen. Um, purchasing fabrication and installation um, is, is an interesting part of this process too. Um, uh, you're going to have people that will question why on earth are you having custom fabrication? Can't you just buy the signs, um, you know, it's like, no, you really can't. Um, yeah, and installation is like, well, don't you just put it up on a wall? Well, you saw the pictures of my building. You can't put it up on a wall. You have to actually make it part of the library's infrastructure. And that's kind of what this really is. We're talking about investing in our social infrastructure. Libraries are social infrastructure. And um, by enhancing them through an effective wayfinding and navigation system, um, you really can make a difference to your community. So um, at this point, we can now wrap up. And um, if you have any questions, we have a little bit of time. Yes? Well, we're going to take that stair sign off of the stairs. Yeah, yeah. We're right now preparing to strip the building of all of the existing confusing and and, and uh, totally uncomplimentary signage before we do the new system. Yes. Anything? Anybody else for any? Of, yes. Well, um, Ashley, uh, I, there. You, you will have, depending on where you are located, I mean, I'm in Huntington Beach, California. Um, we still kind of live behind the orange curtain. And um, uh, yeah, my community is, is mixed, but there is a very, very conservative, why, does, why do things cost so much um, perspective um, there? And you will run into some people that will look at you like, oh, you're just talking about signs, aren't you? Um, why are they so expensive? Um, but if you have the data and you've gone through the process and you can show the reports and you can break it down for people, you can break down and you can exp they, they get it after um, you show them all of that. So, shall I answer that one? Yeah. 
Um, the bilingual, it, the bilingual, it depends on the service model. So I've got some clients who have got quite a big population that require the second language, but the client also doesn't have very big libraries and feels like that having dual language signs become too overwhelming. And if they have got people in their library, they want to be able to offer them one-to-one -one help if they need it. So that's their service model. So their goal is to get the people that can have the independent experience on their way, on their independent experience. They're not asking where the restrooms are. That's freeing up the staff time that they can help the people that really need the assistance. Um, the other thing I tend to build in a lot is the use of symbols. So for the service points in the main facilities, symbols are the unifying language. So that can get people to the help they need or the service they need. Um, and then, as I say, it depends on the service model of the library, how they move forward. And naming conventions yeah. for deaf? Yeah, there's uh, different things going on. I mean, yeah. I, you know, being research-based, I'll always go back to, I, Stephanie, you yeah. tell me what happens at that desk. Yeah. Okay, I see what happens at that desk. Tell me what you want to happen at that desk in a year's time, in two mm -hmm. years' time, in three years' time. Okay, we, so we look at what actually happens there. Yeah. And then we come up with some names that relate to what happens there. So yes, there are a lot of information desks around now. They're doing more than reference. You know, these desks are multifunctional. Yeah. Uh, the information term is also, it, it's familiar. You know, if mm -hmm. you go to the airport, you go to a museum, you know, we're using terms that people are using on other user experiences. Um, accounts. Yeah, or and no desks. desks. Yeah, or and some have no desks. Or no yeah. desks. Or, or no desks. I'm yeah. not. Yeah. We're not having. Yeah. De really, the accounts yeah. desk is probably the only desk yeah. we'll have in our new library. Yeah. It'll be yeah. mobile and services. Yeah, we did quite a lot of work on standardizing what we called things because um, huh, nobody was calling our any part of our building the same thing when we really started our project. Um, the Neutra Wing was like. That was the old building, or it was the north, the north wing. It was the adult section. It w I mean, there were there were like about ten different names for that section of the library, and we went through that in the process, working it out with Wendy to say, okay, no, this is the Neutra wing. It is, you know, we can identify it clearly. It it, it evokes the um, 1975 architecturally significant part of the building. Um, and if we start referring to it as the Neutra Wing, everybody will know where that is. Um, and so we did a lot of that kind of work in our process. And that was a real, that's a real benefit. It starts getting everybody on the same page and talking about things the same way and directions become clearer. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I had the privilege of uh, helping to set up and move into the Super Library. And I wasn't in on the process of designing the signage or wayfinding or anything. Um, so I'm just noticing things, you know, as we're moving in. And did you work on it? When on which library was uh, that? The Hayward one? Or oh, it? no. It's pretty good. I think it's. Uh, oh. We, we, we had a, a, a graphic designer named uh, Matthew Williams oh, okay. do the signage on so that one. So what I noticed were the, um, <coughs> the corner lights on the columns, because I didn't mm -hmm. know that was going to be there, like the orange on the first floor and the children's section and the, the green and blue, I think, the first mm -hmm. floor. Yeah. And that's interesting because you can see above the stack, and you always know what floor you're on it. So I just wanted to know more about that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it, it was a program of colors on the different floors, uh, and then the signage on the floors and some of the other features like that um, are all yeah. integrated, you know, sort of into that thing, so it's easy to tell where you are very quickly. I guess that was the reason that you, you put it high up so that you could see it wherever you were in the space, or just to be playful? Uh, it was to put signage on. There will be, be signage will go on some of those, yeah. and others will just be colored, and then the okay, um, other materials. Yeah, and yeah, so I know it's, we're kind of at the end of our time. Um, please re try and um, do the evaluation of this program if you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, on uh, the mobile app, there's, that's the, has the evaluation forms for you. Um, if you have any further questions, we're around for a little bit and we are happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I hope you found this to be interesting and um, hopefully you will be much more aware of wayfinding when you go around out in public places. I know I am after going through the, the planning process for our project in Huntington Beach. So thank you again very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you.